Hi, welcome everyone to the third biennial New York City Food Waste Fair. Um, before we kick things off, I wanted to give the chat a few, uh, give the crowd a few reminders. Um, for one thing, um, we have a Q and A function, so please, please use that to ask our panelists uh, questions that you might have throughout. Um, we'll get to those questions somewhere towards the end. Um, so, so there's that. Um, I also would like to remind you all to check out the food waste fair schedule. Uh, we still have a few panels and events lined up for the rest of this week. So you can check that out at foodwastefair.com. Um, and I also would like you to check out the food waste toolkit, a resource that we've put together um, for New York City businesses and residents to learn about how to reduce their food waste. And you can find that at foodwastetoolkit.com. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, we um, had our interpreter back out um, for this panel. So a Spanish interpreter will not be available for this. I, I apologize, um, I know it's highly inconvenient, um, but we'll have one for the next panel this afternoon at three. Um, so with that, uh, all uh, laid out, I would like to throw things over to Garrett, our moderator, um, and I'm excited for this conversation. 
All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much to Sam and to the whole group at the Sanitation Foundation um, and to this great turnout today to talk about uh, farm to fork farming, food waste and eating sustainably. Uh, my name is Garrett Broad. I'm an associate professor at Fordham University in the Department of Communication and Media Studies, where my research and teaching focuses on food systems, sustainability, health and equity. Um, and today I am so excited to have three great panelists who are going to be tackling this conversation about food waste from the more production side, although from very different types of production. And so I'm um, very excited to be joined by Rihanna Rosalie, um, who is the head of business development and strategy at Renewable, Nicole Baum, director of business development and partnerships at Gotham Greens, and Reese Williams, executive director at The Good Acre. So for a little bit of context, um, if you've been here uh, at, at the Food Waste Fair, you've already heard some of these statistics, right? That the US discards more food than any other country in the world, nearly 40 million tons every year, that approximately 30 to 40% of food that farmers around the world produce is never consumed. And a lot of the discussion on food loss and food waste tends to focus on the post-harvest, on the retail and on the consumer levels. But importantly, and what we're really gonna be thinking through in this panel today, an estimated one third of edible produce remains unharvested in the fields. In addition, around 20 to 30% of water used across US farms is lost due to poor irrigation systems, evaporation, and overall poor water management. So this panel explores the issue of agricultural production and food waste, discussing some really innovative solutions to the problems from farm to fork. So let's jump right in, shall we? Shall we? Um, so to get us started, I wanna just do a little bit of a round table. And once again, a big welcome to our panelists and also just so excited to see such a big group of attendees. Uh, once again, you can feel free to put questions into the Q&A as we're having this conversation. If you wanna get into the chat and have some of your own discussion there as well, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, but we're gonna do a little bit of a go round um, and we wanna hear from Rihanna and Nicole and Reese. Can you just just give us a little bit of a background first about your organization, about your role within that organization, and how does your work connect to the issue of food waste? And I also see, you know, a, a question in the chat already, you know, where, where are you coming from right now? So can you just give us some background and then how does your work connect to the topic of food waste? Rihanna, let's start with you. All right, awesome. Hi guys, pleasure to be here. So I'm Rihanna, I'm head of business development strategy as Garrett has already described. Um, I work with Renewable, amazing company. What we do is we take vegetative food byproducts, we transform it, and then we turn it into organic hydroponic nutrients. And then we sell it back to soilless farms and they then can use it to grow their own crops. And the idea is that how we're trying to fix the food waste situation is we're basically eliminating all this food waste that would traditionally go to landfills. And while there are lots of different ways to deal with food waste at the moment, we're trying to fill that gap. And um, we're also helping a lot of these farms to grow organically. And albeit, you know, there is a definition of whether, you know, organic is soil based or not, we try and help organic, uh, sorry, soilless farms move towards that direction. And uh, yeah, that's what we do. And Rihanna, could you just tell us like, how did you get into this role? How did you connect to Renewable? Yeah, absolutely. So my background is actually in finance, investment banking. So I was originally in Southeast Asia and, um, you know, I kept finding myself drawn to um, community uh, gardening, community farming. And when I moved to the U.S., I decided to pivot into this career in the field of agriculture because I, I loved it. And then I kept bumping into renewable and I Honestly, I just approached the CEO and founder. I was like, hey, I love what you do. I love the culture. I love the ethics. I believe in your mission. I want to work with you guys. So here I am. <laughs> awesome. Great. And here you are today uh, talking about the really interesting and innovative work uh, that Renewable is doing. So thanks so much, Rihanna. Uh, let's go to you, Nicole. Tell us a little bit about what does Gotham Greens do? What, what's your role there? And how does, it, how does it all connect to this topic of food waste? Awesome, thank you, thanks for having me. And similar to Rihanna, I actually, out of school, I was working for a private equity firm, um, doing some work on renewables, but uh, mostly really there to kind of pay off my school debt. Um, and just realized, you know, a couple years in that it really wasn't kind of my life purpose and I wasn't really getting everything I wanted to out of the experience. So started looking towards, you know, how do I use 
my business and marketing background um, with my interest in food and sustainability. And that similarly, I pitched the CEO and was fortunate that it was like really early days and was one of the first employees at Gotham Greens back in 2014. Um, just as a little bit of background, um, Gotham Greens were a local produce brand and fresh food company. So we started in Brooklyn, New York back in 2011. And our founders really came up with this idea because they realized that so much of the fresh produce that we have access to in the US is really coming from two places, California and Arizona. These places also happen to be deserts and you know, fresh produce is very highly perishable and it takes you know, days, sometimes even multiple days to get to um, a distribution center and processing center. And by the time it arrives on the East Coast to places like New York City or Boston or Baltimore, it's really, it's been at least a week. So they realized what if we actually built these really commercial scale farms in cities hired local people and were able to grow fresh produce, harvest every day, and then deliver directly to local retailers and to local restaurants. Um, we were really fortunate early on to have buy-in from customers like Whole Foods Market and Chef Mike Anthony at Gramercy Tavern, and over the years have really expanded our model. So now we've gone from one greenhouse on a rooftop in Brooklyn to now a network of regional greenhouses throughout the country. So we're in New York City, we have three greenhouses. Um, we have one in New England, which is servicing um, the, the from Maine really to Connecticut. Baltimore is the mid-Atlantic region, Denver where I'm located today, and we're getting ready to expand also um, to the West Coast, to California. So really our mission really came from um, wanting to address food access, but also the you know food waste that's associated with transporting fresh produce across the country. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks so much. And, and thanks for being with us today, Nicole. And yeah. folks can find uh, you know, Gotham Greens products in if they're in the New York City area, as many are here. Uh, you can find, I saw their, their pesto uh, in the stores the other day, as, as well as the greens to go along with it, right? Um, uh, great. So, uh, Reese, um, we've just heard from uh, Renewable talking about their upcycling for hydroponics. Um, Gotham Green's also doing greenhouse hydroponics. Um, but, Reese, you're working in more traditional land based agriculture, farm, traditional farming. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, Good Acre does out there in Minnesota and how you got involved and, and what the connection to food waste is specifically? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Garrett. Um, yeah, the Good Acres is a nonprofit food hub. Uh, we've been around about six years, um, and uh, I've been around from the very beginning. Um, at the heart of what we do is trying to build markets for farmers, specifically BIPOC farmers. That's our focus, and we do whatever we can to make that happen. Uh, and that's food waste is a killer for small farmers. I mean, you just can't, the margins are so tight, you're not making any money. Anyway, you don't wanna waste anything. So we work very hard to help our farmers get around. And how, and how, about, how about you, Reese? How did you get into this work? Well, I'm a, I was a farmer for many years. I farmed up in upstate New York for a while and out on the um, Washington state up in British Columbia, fruit and vegetables for about 28 years. And so I've always stayed close. I worked for a wholesaler as a buyer for a little while. So my, the, yeah, I've always tried to build markets. That's my gig. And, mm -hmm. and local markets is the most important thing for us. Uh, Minnesota, we've got a pretty vital um, community uh, and, and local is really important to the people who live there. And we've been trying to build it and try and then bringing BIPOC farmers into the system because traditionally they have not been involved in it. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's a challenge, but, uh, yeah, six years in, we're still at it. Yeah. And so let me, let, let's, let's delve into that a little bit more. So, you know, you mentioned you sort of build these collaborations, Good Acre serves as this kind of hub to, to build these market access for mostly small farmers, BIPOC farmers in particular, when it comes to this issue of kind of on-farm food waste, is this something that's already on the radar of these farmers? Do you have to kind of bring it to their attention? Do they already have good ideas that they're implementing, but they just need support? Like, could you just give us a little more, like how does the food waste aspect fit into what they're already doing and what support do you provide? Well, food waste, I mean, like I said before, food waste is vital um, and it's something to be avoided at all costs. You know, they don't have the small, the farmers we work with are five acres or less. We work with 60 farmer, Hmong farmers, 
okay? They don't have the resources to waste a lot of food. They don't have the resources to waste a lot of money. Many of them are on marginal ground, you know? So what we try to do is work ways that they can take advantage of the situation they do have. The, the, right now, climate change is kicking everybody around and it's making it so much more difficult to avoid food waste. For instance, we have, we five of the last seven falls have been wet in Minnesota. And not, you know, that caused all kinds of problems for people. And we've, so we're encouraging people to plant different crops, um, broccoli, cauliflower, crops that used to be very popular, easy to grow, are more difficult now because of the, all the moisture. They get black rot and it stays in the soil and it wipes out small farmers. And we have the advantage of context. We, I have a full-time member of my staff who works directly with farmers and his job is to make it easy for him. So he goes out, he visits them, soil samples, leaf samples, doing anything he can to help them avoid what's coming. Now, you know, it's, it's hot as heck here now. It's 90, mm. it's been 90 for two weeks, right? So it's a different, you know, like we're kind of running, trying to anticipate what the climate will be the next day, nothing's as it was. There's no standards. The, the crops that we used to depend on in Minnesota have become harder to grow. So we try to stay on top of that, encourage um, farmers to diversify um, and, and be open-minded to suggestions we have because things are changing so quickly. It's interesting. Um, so it's sort of like addressing the food waste problem instead of at the end of the cycle, at, at the very at beginning. The begin, the at the beginning. And, and doing, I mean, things such as curing. In Minnesota, people grow a lot of root crops. That's where you make money, okay? Uh, in the season, you're competing, your farmer's markets. Most of our farmers sell at farmer's markets. Well, there's many farmers in the same space. So what we do is, you know, winter squash, potatoes, onions, uh, sweet potatoes. We encourage them to grow those crops because you can make money off them and then get them into curing the crops. Right, so it's taking something that isn't familiar to many of the farmers we work with. It's a new concept to the farm, but we build systems in order for them to secure or to cure their crops so they're keeping throughout the season. We raise money to do that. We also, last year, we started a program called LEAF, uh, which was um, local emergency assistance farmer fund, where we raised money. We had racial unrest in Minnesota, it was really, really bad. The, the murder of George Floyd caused farmers markets to shut down. Farmers had already mm -hmm. harvested. We talked to our farmers, said, bring it to us, we'll buy it. So we started this program, raised a bunch of money and donated the food back into food banks, encampments were in all the parks in the Twin Cities, um, trying to rescue that food from going into the dumpster. We purchased it at cost, you know, at at, at the price that it was sold at and then donated it back. So that was sort of, we're doing that again this year. Okay. Hunger relief now is part of our mission. And that's another piece of it that we hadn't been involved in in the past, but now we're in with both feet because it's very much needed by our community and the farmers depend on. Great, thanks so much, Reese. Nicole, yeah. let, let's go to you a little bit and, and talk a little bit about hydroponic greenhouse technology. So that's what Gotham Greens uh, builds from, uh, grows from. Can you tell us a little bit more about the growing approach um, and what the implications of hydroponic greenhouse gas, uh, excuse me, hydroponic greenhouses are for on-farm waste, for produce, water, or other elements of the growing product process? Yeah, absolutely. So just kind of high level, hydroponics basically involves growing produce or growing things without the use of soil. So instead of the plants getting their nutrients from dirt um, and the nutrients within the dirt, they're actually getting it from the water and we're creating different proprietary recipes like nutrient recipes per plant. So for example, you know, basil has different nutritional needs than say a head of butterhead lettuce. Um, in our greenhouses, like I mentioned before, you know, especially on the East Coast or in places like Chicago where there are really cold winters and hailstorms and lots of wind, um, you can't grow year round. And so part of our model is really to build these commercial scale facilities, kind of like the picture you can see behind me. Um, this is our greenhouse in Gowanus, Brooklyn on top of Whole Foods. Um, 
we're able to really build these commercial scale facilities so we can grow all year round. And we use a bunch of different technology that really help us to create the perfect environment for our plants. So in this picture, you can see like the windows go up and down, the rooftop automatically opens and closes. There are actually sensors throughout the greenhouse that take in light levels and CO2 and temperature and humidity. And all of that information is fed to a computer control system which turns equipment on and off. And in terms of food waste, this is really helping us to combat any, you know, ugly produce because we're not, our produce is not having to face, you know, windstorms or, or kind of like have this like really intense um, pressure from pests or from, you know, uh, climate. So basically what we're really doing um, in our greenhouses, we're actually introducing beneficial insects as well um, to avoid having to use harmful things like pesticides. Um, and we're really kind of creating this perfect environment for the plants. So as you had mentioned kind of early on, so much like at least 20% of the produce is actually um, across the industry is being you know, left in the field or is some of that waste is really coming from the, at the farm to agricultural practices. Um, and so we're really able to eliminate a lot of that waste by just really growing these uh, highly perishable leafy greens in a really controlled environment. So we have consistent yields all year round. If, um, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna I was just... say, you know, there, there's this blending of kind of new tech here, but also greenhouses have been around for a very long time. So I just think that's totally. something interesting there. You, you folks are trying to kind of find that hybrid. There's some other models um, that are completely indoor and com are, are depending on like LED lights and things like that. Yep. That's not what you folks are doing. You're depending on natural sunlight as your primary energy light source, right? Exactly. Yeah. So to the second part of your question, kind of around energy use. And um, that's a huge benefit of growing in greenhouses is that we're actually using the natural sun for photosynthesis. So we're not relying upon, you know, really energy intensive things like LED lights to be creating photosynthesis for the plants. Um, also, we do have subsidiary lighting in place. So in the winter months or, you know, when it's like really cloudy, we will have those lights automatically turn on, but no one needs to be in the greenhouse to actually do that. We're using technology. So all of that is automated and um, we're really incentivized to be very energy efficient because we've committed to using 100% renewable electricity to power all of our facilities. So, you know, whatever is not um, produced by the natural sun, we will use subsidiary lighting, but um, all of our water is recirculated and recycled, um, which really enables us to use 95% less water than traditional soil based practices. So water uh, agriculture is the leading cause of global water pollution. Um, and it's also the, the largest consumer of fresh water on the planet. So we're really being super mindful about how much water we're using and really recycling all that water for reuse. Great, thanks. And so speaking of recycling in hydroponics, um, that is a great transition into the work that Rihanna and Renewable are doing. So Renewable, you upcycle unrecoverable vegetative food byproducts into organic hydroponic nutrients. Can you put that into English for me. Um, what does that mean? What does upcycling mean? Why is this a useful approach? Where does this vegetative food byproduct come from? Um, can, yeah, can you break us down a, a little bit more? What, what's going on there at Renewable? There we go. Okay, there You're good we go. now. Hi. <laughs> no, I was just saying that I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because People have different approaches to upcycling and it's really important to understand both at an individual level and a company level, what is your North Star? What is your definition? So I'll give two examples, right? The main idea behind upcycling is that you use discarded items and you create new products. Excellent. But there are other opinions where, okay, fine, you're moving up the supply chain, but are you actually improving the quality? Is the dollar value of the product that you're creating actually going up? Right. So, again, up to you to decide what you want. And there are a couple of things to keep in mind. So two things that we always think about is, number one, if you're a company and you want to create scale, you really have to ensure that you have a viable product. You know, it can't just be something that, OK, that was cool to make. Great. And I know it sounds it sounds basic, but sometimes people don't think about this. They think, OK, you know, I'm just going to make this item and it's kind of cool that it exists. But really, is it a usable product? The second thing that we think about as well is, is there an off taker? 
that this off-taker really has to see value in your product. And when we say this, we let me, I'll give an example. Say, for example, let's say a company decides to make um, a plastic phone case. Cool, looks great. There's someone that might buy it. But the reality is that with plastic, you're going to be exposed potentially to price fluctuation because plastic is very, very closely correlated to the oil market, right? So that's going to go up and down. So what's really important is for a business to set up all these long-term off-take agreements. And again, if the off-taker sees the value in your product, they're going to want to be part of that long-term agreement. So as a company, the, the value of thinking about upcycling, the value of defining upcycling for you is really good because it allows you to look at your business model and think long term, right? How is it going to work? What type of contracts do I need to set up? How do I make sure there is value to the person that's buying it? So kind of bring it back to us and your question about what exactly we do in layman term. I'll give an example. We go to food processors and distributors and they say, okay, we've got, I'll take an example of say carrots, right? We're going to sell this to the consumer, but hey, you know, we don't need the carrot head. So we're going to cut that off. We're going to throw it away. And we say, no, wait, there's something in the carrot head. There are nutrients in there. Who decided that it's disposable? Who decided that there's nothing in there anymore that can be used, right? So a lot of these guys, they want to do the right thing. So they'll say, okay, you can take it. So we'll take it. And as I mentioned, we'll process it. And then we make sure that there's absolutely no chemicals in there. And it allows these soilless farms, these indoor farms, vertical farms, you name it, hydroponic farms, they can then take this put this into their system, they'll take their water reservoir, their water tank, they'll pour the nutrients in, which are from us, sourced from us, and they can grow these, whatever it is, basil, whether it's tomatoes, so on and so forth. And they can grow it knowing that there are no chemicals in there. And the consumers then eat things that are completely chemical free. And the idea behind it again is that two things. Number one, we have created a viable product, as I mentioned earlier, because farms want to reduce their dependency on mineral salts. And I didn't explain this earlier, but basically mineral salts is what the current industry is mostly using. Mineral salts come from mining, mostly, and um, you know they come from various places. Some of them come from places in the US, but there are also some that come from places like Russia and China, which is far away. And so you have to think about the environmental impact of these mineral salts. So a lot of these farms are fully aware of that. We're not, the, we're not the first to talk about this with them. They're very well informed, but they want to transition over, right? So we're helping them do that. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, we, we really want to make sure that we're recirculating food back into the food system, because as I mentioned, there's still value. We really need to change the narrative about what food waste is. Why is it termed waste? Um, you know, I'll give the example of uh, Baldor, which is a company, a food processor and food distributor. They refer to waste as um, um, sparks. And the idea is that, you know, if you change how you look at it, if you change how you refer to it, you're really forcing people to rethink what waste really means to them. So we're reintroducing that and we're going at it from a company level, but ideally then these farms can go to their consumers and say, hey, you should also rethink what you consider as being waste. Yeah, I think that's so fascinating as a, you know, as a communication researcher too, the way we name things, the way we label things, the way we frame things. It's also making me think of how like, you know, if you've got a, a kid that you're trying to make eat their vegetables, if you like give it a fun name, how they're more likely to eat it. But I think that that sort of reframing of what is waste and what, what does it mean to be waste and, and, and how might that be integrated into the system um, and thought of as something other than waste, which suggests something that needs to go away. Um, I think that's really interesting. So um, all of these projects, first of all, it's great to hear about these really interesting projects that are taking different approaches here, um, but are all addressing, you know, food, food markets and food access and providing healthy food for folks. I um, mean, all three of these projects in a different way have, have a kind of local element to it. And so I'm wondering what you see as the connection between local food production and distribution and food waste. I think Nicole spoke to this a little bit in terms of transportation stuff, but like uh, what are the strengths of local food in terms of food waste? And are there, are there downsides when it comes to local food and its connection to food waste or things that we should you know, be mindful of, um, problems to address? Maybe Nicole, you can kick us off because you've already mentioned that a little bit, but how does the local element connect to the food waste? Totally. 
Thank you. That's a good question. So yeah, early on, our model really was about how do we build these farms in close proximity to urban consumers, right? So we can eliminate that long haul transportation. And also by growing locally, we can not only provide a better quality, fresher tasting, more nutritious product, but also really support the communities in which we have farms. So for us, it's really, it goes on many, many levels, but it's, yes, creating these regional farms. So when we think about local, we think about regional. Um, so product that's grown in say Providence, Rhode Island is not gonna be servicing Chicago, the Chicago market. We have a green or two greenhouses in Chicago that will help to service that Midwest region. So when we think about local in terms of production, we think about regional production. When we think about our communities, we're really focusing on food access. So connecting consumers to where their food comes from, but also working with large food pantries and you know, Feeding America organizations um, to really help to increase food access. You know, similar to what Reese was talking about in the last year, there is just, we saw an exponential growth and amount of need in our communities and people facing food insecurity, food apartheid, um, really food access across the board. And so we, we provided over 300,000 pounds of produce to community organizations, nonprofits, that really we're helping to distribute that to our neighbors facing food insecurity. So really on a production level, we think about it um, regionally and we, we've seen you know, that regional food systems um, are really in, in times of crisis like last year, really important. You know, there's a, they're really nimble um, and there's a lot of opportunity to really support the people that are helping to, to run these farms and the people in your community and um, that's an important aspect of, of how we think about local food production is, is how do we um, make sure that we're you know, harvesting in the morning, we're packaging on site, and then we're delivering directly to grocery stores and to restaurants and food service groups within our region. Thanks. Reese. I wonder if I can follow up on this with you, because you were talking earlier about sort of the you know, support and the collaborations you've built with BIPOC farmers with Hmong farmers specifically operating on a small scale. Um, so clearly this kind of local and small approach is central to what Good Acre does. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about why that's you know, your model. Um, and also, you know, I think one of the critiques sometimes of local and small is that the scale of it, you know, might actually lead to more waste or less efficiency. And just wondering how you folks think about kind of concepts like efficiency when you're working with smaller farmers, you know, uh, uh, less capital kind of uh, intensive uh, operations like you work with in, in Good Acre. You know, part of it is education. I mean, it's education, the markets that we're trying to get into. When we started the Good Acre, I thought we could do institutional sales. I didn't want to bump into farms that were already in the in the grocery stores and there was already, they'd been there established. I didn't want to step on toes. So we thought we could be working with some of the larger uh, food companies in the Twin Cities. Um, it's still in process. Um, their understanding of what is food waste and our understanding is totally different. And they, the, the ones we were working with were wasting so much food that we pulled out of it. You know, um, they wanted, you know, carrot sticks and they wanted, and that, that's just a waste of time as far as we're concerned. We have many, many people who love fresh carrots without having to be sticks. So we just bailed on that and, and, and let it go. So I feel like we did find, it's finding individuals, it's building relationships with individuals to convince them that their food, that they're getting from their community, from their farmers um, is, is worth it and not worth throwing away. I think our work with Farm to School is helping to establish that. I think that's a wonderful, way every community can contribute to this because once the, you know, that's a community center and once they're starting to accept local food and, you know, the problem, I mean, it's not grown in Mexico in sand, you know, or Arizona or in, and it's, so it's not always perfect, but it tastes the same. And so, and it's, it's grown by your neighbors. So that's our job is to convince the people that we sell to that this is exactly the same as you're gonna get from California or Mexico. It's gonna cost a little bit more because it, it, it does because it costs a little bit more to grow, but it's worth it as we build community and, and build a market for our farmers. So that's sort of where we go with it, you know, and, it, and, it, and we find individuals that listen. You know, um, it takes a while. 
Great, thanks. So yeah, a little, yeah. a little more, you know, labor intensive in that sense, both in terms of the community building and the farming itself. But there's also some tangible and and intangible kind of value that it sounds like emerges from that model in the community that you're building there. Rihanna, how about the local element for renewable? Is that something that is part of the model here? It seems like it doesn't have to be local, but it sounds like that it has been part of the approach thus far. Hey, Rihanna, I'm not sure your audio has gone out. Maybe unmute and... Are we okay now? Yeah, there you go, okay. <laughs> Maybe a third time's a charm, right? So hopefully the third time you won't be used it. Um, so it's really, really important to us. Uh, it's a big part of what we should do. Um, you know, our founder, he does the same kind of work in terms of um, influencing um, people and just these little quick things. Hey, Rihanna, I'm sorry, but it sounds like your audio's gotten very low. I don't know if other folks are hearing that as well. Might, sometimes it's like a headphone issue or something like that. Keep talking. Let's try that again. Better, better, better. Okay, I'm just gonna keep my head as close to the computer as possible. Please do. <laughs> All right, so yeah, I was just saying that it's really important to us. You know, a big part of what we believe in is about going local and if we're there are a couple of things so we looked at it at the hierarchy in terms of food waste management and we oh i think it are people still saying they can't hear me i'm seeing I, I think it's gotten i think it's gotten better so just okay. keep keep going and stay close okay <laughs> all right you're gonna see my quiz really close then um so from a food waste side you know Composting was a big thing. I think there's a lot of really good stuff actually that's happening at local level. So composting is huge, right? Everyone knows about composting. Everyone's talking about composting. Excellent. But the problem is that composting infrastructure is very different region by region. So at a local level, you're going to find that there's going to be a lot of disparity. So really, for example, like in upstate New York, you're going to have one type of composting infrastructure and then downstate it's going to be completely different. So a lot of food processors find that they struggle to find ways to send food waste to composting um, uh, uh, locations. And what we found was that some of them are even paying up to, I think it was like 50000 a month to get rid of their food waste, which is a lot of money. <laughs> and so, you know, that that's, that's definitely an issue that we have found from a local area. And so we say, okay, you know what? Let's try and fill this gap. Let's try and see how we can off take this for them so that they don't have to worry about the cost that comes with it. Because at the end of the day, they're a business and they do have to think about their profit and loss, right? They have to think about their bottom line. So that was one side of things. The other aspect is from a local side, a lot of these farms, as I mentioned, their ethic and their ethos is completely in line with what we're looking to do. But what they have realized is that in terms of manpower, they don't, a lot of them, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nicole, like you may have experienced or have experienced this, but we found that they don't have um, horticulture specialists who are on the team on site every day that can mix these like dry mineral salts or these liquid fertilizers and so on and so forth, which is what we uh, provide as a solution, right? And so the, the problem now is manpower, right? Like how do they fill this gap without also reducing their um, bottom line? And so that's where we come in as well, where we say, hey, you know what? We have a solution where you don't have to worry about this. So we're trying to make sure that all angles of this local food production is covered and again we're not trying to replace any aspect of local food production but we're trying to make sure that we're assessing where that needs to be something that needs to be filled and there's definitely lots of opportunity there and you know i think there's uh, there's a lot of awareness and that's really really inspiring for us um especially as we continue to scale up Great, so thanks so much for that. So we've covered a lot of ground already. I'm also seeing some great questions in the, um, in the Q&A, so keep them coming and we'll use the last 15 minutes or so to make sure we get those answered. But one of the things I'm also thinking of here, you know, this is uh, a, a food waste fair hosted by the New York City Sanitation Foundation, which is the official nonprofit organization of the New York City Department of Sanitation. And so it's getting me thinking about policy. And, you know, we've got 
all these initiatives happening at the kind of business and the nonprofit level. Um, but what could be done from the policy side um, that you think could, you know, support the work that you're doing or support the kind of broader movement towards the type of goals that you're looking to advance in food and agriculture? Um, anybody want to jump in on that? If, you know, I think we've got some policymakers out in the audience, so you maybe have their ear right now. Well, what do you want to hear? What do you want policymakers to hear from you and how could they support your, the, your work and how could they support this broader movement towards reducing uh, food waste in, in our food and agricultural system? Anybody want to jump in on that first? Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, checking first, can you hear me? Yes, you sound good. <laughs> Okay, awesome. So, you know, a lot of our farms, they want to move to the organic space, but there's still that debate, right? Is soilless, purely soilless, um, actually even considered organic? Because a lot of these people say that, not a lot of these people, but the debate is basically that if you're not affecting soil, then you can't really be considered organic. And we completely respect that. We understand the rationale for that. But what we'd love to see is for policymakers to create a holistic approach to this and to really understand or to perhaps develop something that identifies how every step of the food production process is using inputs which come from an organic source and or an organic growing method. Um, for us, that's a, kind of like the bigger picture. So it's not just like one boxed area of things. We'd love to see if that's something that could potentially be approached. Um, and of course, you know, hearing the perspectives of soilless and traditional soil-based farming, um, understanding whether they agree with this or not, that would be really, really great to see and really great to um, see policymakers can address this as well. Interesting, great, thanks. Yeah, Nicole, did you wanna hop in as well, talking to policymakers here? Sure, yeah. Um, so I think holistically, as a, as a company, we're really thinking about regional stronger food systems, right? And um, historically, the government has been really involved in helping to subsidize like major monocrops like corn and soy. And I think in the last year, especially as we've seen a larger reliance upon regional food systems and how they can actually really help to, you know, not just employ um, people within the regions, but also provide better and more like nimble um, food production. So you're not waiting on, on these trucks. There's a lot of opportunity to really continue to invest in, in local regional food systems. Um, and also to kind of Reese's point around um, in the last year, being able to work with you know farm to school programs. I think those are awesome and, and continuing to kind of um, work to eliminate some of the, the kind of boundaries, these things that are, mostly recent, you know, around um, kind of barriers to entry, right? Like there's a lot of paperwork, you know, just because you're a farmer doesn't necessarily mean you're great at writing grants. Um, there's a lot of a lot of challenges. And I think that um, our politicians can really help to um, kind of eliminate those and to also increase access um, for smaller and mid-sized farms. Also, another thing that really impacts food waste is enjoy by dates. Um, and mm -hmm. We haven't really talked much about that within this conversation, but you know, there's a lot of confusion for consumers around Best Buy or Enjoy Buy rates. And I know for Gotham Greens, I can speak to our shelf life. You know, we're, we're able to pass along about like three weeks of shelf life from the day our product is harvested to the you know, time where you know, it can make its way to consumers' refrigerators. Um, but I think like even knowing our company, we are really conservative. With that, with that date, and you know, I've had people write to our info account, being like, "What did you put in this lettuce?" I went on vacation, I came back, and it's still fresh. Um, so I think that it's just like as an industry, and uh, there's really a lot of opportunity to kind of like create a little bit more um, consistency across the board, because um, dairy enjoy by dates are different than produce. Um, and you've and got I enjoy buy, happens. sell buy, best exactly. buy, this whole mess. And I know that there have been uh, efforts by some food waste advocates to standardize that or just make them make more sense and be legible to consumers. Certainly. Yeah. And, you know, um, I think for retailers too, that accounts for loss right. of product, right? Which makes them have to increase the prices because they have a larger industry wide, it's called shrink. So I think there's really an opportunity um, across the board to help standardize these sell by mm. enjoy by rates um, and really help to educate the consumer on what is safe to eat and what is not. Great, uh, Reese. how about you on the policy front? What, what could be done? 
Well, one of the things that came out of last year, out of all the bad things that came out, was money was put into areas that hadn't been put into before, and, and, and hunger relief. And we were able to establish relationships with um, larger hunger relief um, agencies that we hadn't before because they just didn't pay enough. You know, they're used to buying commodity crops at four cents a pound, and we can't really afford to do that. And our farmers certainly can't. So this past year, 2020, we had money spent on our farmers uh, on the crops that they were growing that went into hunger relief, and it was a big hit. And they, they received a lot of compliments from people receiving the food. Unfortunately, there were a lot of people receiving the food. And, and, and also, um, we, grew, we gave them culturally appropriate crops. Um, and so uh, we did uh, bitter ball, which is an Asian eggplant and sweet potato leaves, things that our, our farmers grew for their market. They went into the um, hunger relief system and went to food shelves that dealt with that population. And so it was great. And the people really liked them and everything, you know, everything went quickly. Uh, eliminating a lot of the food waste that would have been because a lot of the typical food that was coming out of these food shelves wasn't being picked up because it what people didn't want to they weren't familiar with it so i feel like money put in the right place can help build community build and help local farmers um to survive yeah, so uh, thanks so much. And, and so we've got about, say, 15 minutes left here. And I do want to turn my attention to some of the really great questions that have come in. Um, let me start with, um, so I, we've, we've touched on this a little bit, but there's a question about just sort of large scale agribusiness and what, what's often called the hourglass food system, where we've got, you know, uh, this, this kind of bottleneck in the middle where there's just a handful of processors um, and retailers that are kind of shaping what gets out to many, many consumers. Um, any thoughts on sort of what role that plays in, in food waste in North America? Um, just the kind of big, and we, we've touched on this a little bit, but just kind of big picture, the political and economic structure of our food and agricultural system? Is that bad for food waste? Is that, are there opportunities for food waste there? Are you offering alternatives to that? Do you see the work that you're doing sort of operating in parallel to that or potentially replacing that? Just how do you, how do you think about the work that you do in relation to sort of the dominant system as it exists today? Anybody thoughts on that one? I mean, I, I can say sure, please. the system encourages food waste. I mean, that's why it was built. Um, and um, what we're trying to do is localize it and, and eliminate some of those barriers that people have. Uh, I worked, I was an orchardist for years out in Washington State on large orchards, um, and we trashed a lot of fruit, you know, and we didn't have a market for it and it went down. And when prices changed, food stayed, you know, I mean, if, if a price drops and a tomato's out in the field, you can't afford to pick it. You know, so you leave it there and it rots and, and, and it's, it's uh, plowed under. I feel like that was standard for many of the large agricultural businesses. That's just what they did. It was cheaper to leave it in the field than it was to pick it. So, so I feel like what we're trying to do is take advantage of that, you know, and not waste that food and, and give our farmers incentive to get as much as they can out of the ground. They're only on five acres. You know, mm -hmm. they need to get as much as they can out of it. And we're, that's kind of our philosophy is let's help them get as much as they can. Thanks, so, Nicole, it seems like in the work that Gotham Greens does, you're, you're kind of somewhere in between, right? Because there is a lot of focus on sort of efficiency and, and yield and this idea about scaling up at the regional level, but you're also kind of, you know, Putting, uh, positioning yourselves a little bit in, in opposition to some of the standard practices. So just sort of wondering how you see your work within that broader context. Yeah, that's a good question. So really like we think of ourselves as a complementary part of a local food system in addition to soil-based farming. We don't, you know, I think um, a lot of people, especially media like to kind of position it as like, this is the future of farming and this is going to, you know, replace all different other types of farming. And we just yeah. really don't think that's the case. Um, if you look at our models, you know, our, our eight greenhouses across the country, we've historically really positioned our, our locations in places where there are, are high rates of unemployment. So, you know, this can be a vehicle for local job production, but also like we've, we've located our farms at places like the former Bethlehem Steel Mill in Baltimore, 
or on a super fun site in Brooklyn, New York, where we can actually create local food production in places where you would never be able to have soil based production. Um, and so I, I really like I, I really think of this as a complementary form of farming and, it, you know, two things like, you know, soil based potato production. Um, we don't really think that there's a, a very commercially viable way of growing things like potatoes or beets or corn in hydroponic systems. Um, but you do definitely see hydroponics used for things like tomatoes and different types of berries in addition to highly perishable crops like lettuces and herbs. So that's really kind of where we see um, the, the scope of our, our model. Um, and certainly seeing a lot of different companies coming into the space with various different formats of indoor farming. And now we really just think that there's a role for all of these different uh, formats of, of farming to play in the kind of larger picture of a more sustainable food system. Um, I also saw that somebody within the chat um, was asking just about production. And you're right, like we definitely, um, we are, our, our farms are definitely quite small compared to like a field grown production. So um, for example, the scale is typically a half an acre, um, which is like our smallest greenhouse, like the one behind me on top of a Whole Foods in Brooklyn is about a half an acre, but it actually produces that of about a 10 acre soil based farm because it's super productive. You know, again, these plants are really coddled. Um, the plant sites are very close to each other. And so um, we're, we're kind of creating that perfect growing environment for them to really flourish. Um, our larger greenhouses are around 100,000 square feet. So, you know, four, three and a half to four acres in, in square footage, but are again, producing about 30 times the amount of yield from it. So collectively, we think that this is like, really has a role to play in the future of a more sustainable food system, but we don't really like to position ourselves as like, you know, against soil based farms, because that's really, mm -hmm. that's not where we're coming from. Everybody always wants to say they're the, <laughs> the thing, right? But this yeah. is a, you know, we have this super complex food system, uh, locally, regionally, nationally, globally. Um, I don't know why everybody feels like they always need to say this is the one true <laughs> solution, right? Like, yeah. um, there, there are a bunch of, and, and, and Nicole uh, already started to address some of them, you know, in terms of what's grown in hydroponics, et cetera. It seems like, you know, the stuff with, you know, what we would call lower biomass at this stage is the stuff that really makes much more sense in a hydroponic system as you say like probably doesn't make sense to grow like a watermelon or grapefruit or or, or you know or, uh, or or potatoes or whatever that are sort of heavier because the weight uh, you know the weight uh, sort of equation there um, but but there's also some questions Rihanna I don't know if you would want to address that previous question about sort of how you fit within the food system but also there's some basic questions too about like uh, nutrients in the in hydroponics um, and and can you grow the same stuff which we got to a little bit but you know do you want to maybe give us a little bit of a, a prompt Primer on like hydroponic quality, nutrient quality, and does does the, what renewables doing does that have any impact on nutrient quality? And how do we even know that sort of thing? So yeah, feel free to take that wherever you want to, Rihanna. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So we have found that a couple of farms have been asking us about the nutrient value of our product, and we take this as the consumers asking them. And so there's been this increase about what's actually going into that product, which is excellent because it's exactly what we're trying to make sure people understand. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that consumers are consuming what they know is good for their bodies. Um, and of course, you know, there's environmental impact and so on and so forth. So yeah, it's, um, it's something that we're really trying to, uh, to, to make sure is a big part of the conversation. Um, and with our product, we make sure that we have all these lab tests and so on and so forth, so that farms know fully well what's going in and what's coming out. Um, you know, we just actually um, announced a partnership today with um, a, a company called Ketos, and we're working with them to make sure that um, with another technology that we have, which we haven't talked about on this call, but essentially it allows farms to deal with their own food waste on site and then produce their own additional um, nutrients. So um, it's not just us supplementing them, it's them supporting themselves, which is excellent. And so through this partnership, we also make sure that farms are aware of the quality of the water that they're producing. And it's a holistic system. We wanna make sure that every single thing that's going in and out is accounted for and that they know what to tell their consumers and they know how to educate their consumers, which is a very, very big point as well. And I think um, Reese touched upon this earlier, just education. It's super important at this point 
um, and just making sure that we continue this conversation and that we, 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 do, we do make it clear that nutrition is a big thing that um, soilless farms are contributing to as well. So, yeah, if I could follow up on that, because there's also a question in the Q&A about kind of the consumer side here. Um, like, what what do you think, uh, so one of the questions was, you know, what do you think the biggest misconceptions that a consumer may have about the farm side, or or maybe just in general, like, what, what would you want consumers to know about what's happening on the farm, on the production side, um, whether it relates to food waste or your work in general, um, maybe Reese, we can we can go over to you. Um, you know, if we had a megaphone to to be able to communicate to all the consumers out there in the Minnesota area and beyond, you know, what do you think is important for them to know that maybe they don't know right now about the work that you do or about food waste issues in general? So, um, Minnesota has a pretty sophisticated consumer base because of all our food co-ops. We've got about 12 food co-ops in within the um, Twin City area and they support organic and we're, we're certified organic and they, but, but there is a, that it's not enough. And so what we, I mean, what we try to tell people and we have a, we have a CSA program and we have other ways of, of communicating with people is um, that it's expensive to farm in Minnesota that you need to be able to understand that it, we can't compete on price. And, and, and that's big for us with dealing with large corporations, Aramarks and the, and the Sodexcos of the world who, who you know, live on price, who, who is their, one of their biggest factors in, in purchasing your product. We need to, and as, as Rihanna said, education, working with these guys to try to um, convince them that actually it tastes better, but it costs a little bit more. And and because we just can't, we just can't compete. And if the consumer backs us and they back the organic movement, they back the regenerative movement, and they paid a little bit more for those products coming from them, if they can help us with the BIPOC movement. I mean, honestly, that's what we're trying to do is convince them that the farm farmers that we work with that are on five acres that are working their butts off on marginal land to try to make a living uh, deserve uh, to be um, to deserve to be customers of. So that's sort of our, you know, that's our thing with with the consumers in our area is is it's 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 worth it. I mean, it's just worth it. And you're building community and you're building um, uh, an economic viable system for these mm. farmers. It would be hell without them, you know? And people should know that, that there's some responsibility. Thanks. Nicole, how about you on, uh, what would you want consumers to know here? Yeah, similarly, I think Reese said that really well. Um, it's, it's about really strengthening our local food systems, right? And like putting your money where your mouth is, right? It's supporting local businesses and, you know, maybe it, we will always do our best to be, you know, really competitive in price, you know, with other conventional and organic products. But I think it really comes down to like consumers doing their research too, right? And like, um, if you say you believe in and really value a product that's has organic practices, you know, is pesticide free, um, is helping to create local jobs within your community, is, you know, supporting environmental education and wellness programming, um, you know, sometimes that does require additional funding. And I think it's really, um, you know, at the consumer level where you go and you ask for these products, right? Um, or if you're a chef, it's choosing to, you know, maybe spend a little bit more for the product up front, but knowing you have a really good shelf life, you know, it's, it's um, you can't always make these decisions like totally um, blindsided by just on one, one element such as price, like there's a lot that goes into it. So, um, I think it's really just kind of encouraging consumers to continue to do their homework. And I mean, I feel like we have a very engaged um, group here with, with this panel and, and truly care about this stuff. So um, I think it's really just using your, your dollar to really support businesses that are doing the right thing. Great, Rihanna, did you wanna add on onto that? Yeah, I think um, both Nicole and Reese have um, mentioned really, really good points. And I would re it reiterate very, clearly that to consumers, please don't underestimate the power of your voice. As someone who, as a company that supports these farms, they're telling us what you want. And so we're hearing it in real time. And so 
have those conversations with the farms that you buy from. Really, really speak to them. Really tell them what you want. Um, that's one aspect. The other aspect is, uh, and Reese touched upon this earlier as well, and it's something that I found really interesting, was that if you do decide to put your waste, your food waste somewhere, please take into consideration the cultural aspect. Um, it was something that I found really interesting because I hadn't even thought about it, but I learned that a lot of these food banks, they will give, say, for example, a community peas, but perhaps that community doesn't know what to do with peas. They don't know how to cook with peas. They don't like cooking with peas. And so that food just goes to waste. So it, it takes a little bit more work on the consumer side, but knowing that your food isn't just sitting there and then eventually going to a landfill, that's something to keep in mind. Um, so just really, really, um, and to Nicole's point, do your research um, and the, the outcomes are great. And I think that you know once everyone just kind of ver ver verbalizes and vocalizes what they want, and if they take the time to really think about what they're hoping to achieve through their food waste initiatives, we'll be able to make waves. I really believe in it. All right, so first of all, thank you once again to all of our panelists, to the Sanitation Foundation, to all the crew that's been putting this together, um, to all this great uh, you know, a crowd of folks who showed up today uh, with a lot of great questions. We got to a lot of them, but not all of them. So um, I'll, I'll maybe end this here with asking each panelist in 20 seconds, how do we stay involved with you? How do we find out more about you um, and, and the good work that you're up to? So Reese, where can we find you? How can we stay in touch? How can we get involved? Yeah, well, thanks. That's a great offer. Um, the goodacre.org is our, our website. Happily um, share anything we got. I can put our, 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 my email in the, in the chat too if people are interested in communicating. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to take a lot of work. You know, we've been at it for six years. We've barely made a, uh, you know, a dent. Um, but with all of us working together, you know, it, uh, it, we can make some progress. All right. And Nicole, how about you? How do we find out more and get involved with Gotham Greens? Definitely. Um, so if you check out our website, you can actually take a virtual tour of our greenhouses. So that's kind of a cool way to learn a little bit more about our business and the products that we grow. Um, and yeah, check out also on our website, we have a, a store locator. So you can see our packaged salads and herbs and dressings and dips um, are available at you know most grocery stores across the country, as well as online retailers. So those are great places. All right, and Rihanna, Renewable. Unfortunately, we don't have a location for you guys to visit, but we have a really, really good bunch of content online. Um, we've got excellent articles. If you go to our website, renewable.com, um, you know, we try and make sure that we educate um, growers, whether you're a hobbyist or whether you're a big farm, we, we cover the whole spectrum. We've got a lot of good stuff on sustainability as well on our social media, Instagram, a lot of stuff there. Industry news, you want that kind of stuff. We've got that on our Twitter. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff. So check us out on all the various platforms. Um, we're always trying to educate as much as possible and make sure that everyone has uh, information to make as in form of a decision as possible. All right, and so um, we will leave it there. Um, uh, once again, I'm Garrett Broad, and you, I'm easy to get a hold of as well at gbroad at fordham.edu, or you can find me ranting and raving on the internet at Garrett Broad. Um, thank you so much to Nicole and Rihanna and Reese, um, to the Sanitation Foundation uh, for this wonderful conversation today, for doing the good work that you're doing, and to all of you for joining us today. So um, it's 11.01, I'll leave it there. Um, have a great rest of your day, everybody, uh, and thanks for your work trying to support us more healthy, sustainable, and equitable food system. Take care, everybody. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Bye. Thank you. Bye.